Welcome to the Heal Thrive Dream Podcast, where trauma survivors become healthy thrivers. Each month will feature a theme in the trauma recovery and empowerment field. To promote your recovery, healing, and learning how to build dreams, here is your host, Karen Robinson, transformational coach and therapist. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you for joining us again. I have a special guest today. Her name is Paulina Sosa. Paulina is a survivor and also an advocate. She's been on many advocacy initiatives, and I'll get her to tell you more about that. She's also the founder of a Latinx um, community, and she'll also um, share that with us a little bit and define the term for us. Um, One of the really cool things she's done, not that all those things are cool so far, but this to me really stuck out um, is the storytelling project called Breaking the Silence um, for Survivors. I really want to hear about that. And then the other thing that sticks out about Paulina's um, biography is she gives a lot of credit to her healing journey um, for because of her passion for Christ and how he's helped her. So She'll also be speaking about her spirituality journey. I think um, survivors in general have a mixed response to it. Some people are really biblical. Some people have struggled with being biblical after their trauma. So we're going to get to hear her perspective from all that today. So welcome, Paulina. Um, Go ahead and and, uh, tell us a little more about yourself and fill in the gaps I know I missed. (laughs) Great. Well, thank you so much for having me on this uh, podcast, Karen. It's a it's a real pleasure and honor to um, be able to share my story a little bit with with all of you listening today. And so, um, just to kind of add to um, what Karen just mentioned now about my healing journey, um, it's it's exactly for that reason that I'm able to do this at all, um, and that I'm able to share my story with you, and that I'm able to do it um, knowing that what has happened to me does not define me. Um, But knowing that God and um, his strength and his love have in fact revived me um, to be able to do this and and hopefully um, to remind other women out there that they also have a voice and a power um, in their story and in their healing. So um, some other projects that I'm extremely excited to be working on is, uh, as you mentioned, the Latinx Forces Project. Um, so Latinx Forces is an, basically an initiative aimed to, um, again, it comes back to empowerment, to empower the Latinx community um, to use their voice, to use their story, um, and, and really just to be real, right? Because we all have a voice that is equally important. Um, and so what we are doing in Latinx Forces is developing a platform where we can feature the stories of the community. We can feature stories of artists and artisans and just really inspiring small businesses, especially in the time of COVID-19, um, and share that with the world. And so that's essentially what we want to do in Latinx Voices. And because of that, we have also um, have, we have a branch um, focused on COVID-19 response. So we have Latinx COVID-19 Task Force, which is a, an international at this point, um, coalition of international, national, state, and local organizations that have come together to collaborate on solutions and addressing disparities in the community. So all of this comes full circle to one thing, and that is to realizing that my story as a woman, my story as a Latina, and my story as a survivor all matter, and so does yours. And so, um, and really, I have, I have God to thank for that. So that's in a nutshell, um, Mm -hmm. the, the, my little introduction to my, you know, to my story and to the things that I'm doing, but um, I'm very excited to to dive a little deeper into that and, and of course, into the Breaking the Silence project that we just recently launched um, on International Day to End Violence Against Women um, as an effort to empower uh, survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Yeah, really impressive stuff. I'm very honored that you're here and that I've gotten to know you just a, a bit and we'll get to know you better in the future as we maybe collaborate on some projects. And um Maybe I would like you to tell our listeners about how I met you at 
um, our church, like the first event you did and maybe some of the other events you've done? Sure, sure. So Karen and I had the pleasure of meeting at, um, actually, it's a new conference that our church, Grace Community Church, based out of Arlington, Virginia, um, launched. And so this conference was uh, called In His Image, um, because all of us were made in his image. Um, Our past, our traumas, our hurts, and even our coping behaviors do not define us. It's rather God's love that defines us. And so um, the session that I um, facilitated and hosted during the conference was focused on the Me Too movement. Um, And the reality is that a lot of women um, may not realize that they are in an abusive situation, right? So I know for many years I was in an abusive relationship and I didn't realize it because he didn't physically abuse me, but he... um, he emotionally, mentally, and even sexually did. So I, um, for, for many years, didn't realize that until I finally learned about it. And so that session really focused on first understanding what abuse is and understanding the cycle of power and control in a domestic or sexual violence situation. Um, but more importantly, infusing, especially for victims of violence, whether you are currently in a situation or survivors of of violence, um, infusing God into that healing journey. Um, And, you know, the fact is that unfortunately, many of you listening today may still be in a situation. And the reality is that when we realize we're not alone, there is a whole new world that opens up with that. So that was really the, the focus of the session to remind other women that they are not alone, that we are in this together, and that there is a God that cares about every tear that you cry, that there is a God that cares about every day that you have to struggle through that violence or that you have to struggle through the healing. Um, And we know it's not easy, but that was essentially what all of that is. And and when we think about it, that's what the Me Too movement is about as well. It's, It's really realizing that many of us can raise our hands and say, me too. I have been there. And um, your voice matters. So so that's how Karen and I met. And that's, um, you know, that was the start of, of something beautiful in our church. And, and it's been really exciting to see that start to grow and blossom. Um, so much more to come about that, definitely. Yeah. And Paulina has also done a cool thing by starting, would you call it a support group? I think or- we can call it a support group. It's the definitely the beginning of one. Yeah. And I, I'm just so happy and pleased that you've done that. It's it's very powerful. And you could tell how powerful today, like we started today, how that was. And so is it okay to invite listeners who maybe don't have a church family? Um, I know it's okay to invite them to church, obviously, but to how would they um, go about learning about the group and signing up? Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So for any of you listening, you know, I want to invite you to Right now, the best way to kind of plug into the group is just to reach out to me directly. So I'll make sure that my information is shared so you can either feel comfortable to email me or to text me even, and um, we'll make sure to get you plugged in uh, to the right group. And um, I will also add that there are two studies that we are planning on doing. The first is is with the shack. So if you have or have not seen the movie The Shack, I'd recommend uh, during the holiday season to um, to take a watch um, because that movie has just completely uh, changed my own perspective of myself. Um, and then we will also be diving into Breaking Free, a study that Beth Moore created, um, which has also been a very empowering study. So if you're interested, I encourage you definitely to reach out to me directly and, and we'll get you plugged in with a, a group of women that can be there to support, encourage, and pray with you in your journey to healing. Awesome. And do you think we'll stay um, doing it on Zoom so women from anywhere in the world can go or do you think we'll go? back to in person? Um, right now, I foresee it staying on Zoom. I think that, um, that as you mentioned, it, it opens up the opportunities for women that may not uh, live in the D.C. area to, to be able to join this group. And um, I think, you know, depending on 
God's you know direction for the group. We might have have one or two that are in person, but the idea definitely is for this to um, be an online safe space uh, for women uh, to come to and and to support each other. So hopefully that helps any of you listening that that may not be in the DMV area. Yeah, I I liked what you said about us not feeling alone because violence has impacted, you said, many women. I want to say it's impacted most women. Um, If the percentages are in the high 90s, and that's with what's reported, we already know a lot of women um, haven't been able to come forward yet, you know, or or share yet. It can take time, and, and it's individual, you know, none of us can say when's the right time for you, because it can be terrifying, especially if you're still in harm's way or if you've been threatened in any kind of way. Yeah, so I think trauma and abuse and sexual assault can feel very isolating and alone. And it's huge knowing there's communities, there's groups that we can join that can help us feel less alone. I think that's huge. Definitely. And I think that's an important piece uh, for me um, that, that just made a world of difference in my journey, realizing finally that I'm not alone. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and just mention this briefly because I know that many of you listening might have a similar experience where I tried to report report the incident to our school counselor. So this the incident happened in high school. And... Um, you know, the questions that came after I tried to report was, well, why did you go with him? Well, why were you wearing this? Well, why this? And it was all about why I did what I did or why I didn't do what I did. And so, um, so it, it came back and it made me feel it was my fault. It made me feel ashamed and guilty about something that had nothing to do with with the choices I made. And so um, I think many women after a, a dealing with a situation like that, um, dealing with a response like that can can feel more isolated and more alienated in a lot of ways. And, um, and it, in a way can kind of re-traumatize us to mm-hmm. come and speak out to any anyone else. So um, I think it's so important um, for us to just really reemphasize that you're not alone and that we believe you. We believe you, and it's not your fault. So um, I hope that that this feels somewhat safe and somewhat comfortable for you to come and um, and really be a part of this group that we're trying to build in order to create that safe space for you. It was beautiful. Yeah. Okay. I think a good question to ask, since every time I've heard you speak, and then also in your bio, it mentions your favorite scriptures that you find comforting. Mm -hmm. And I know you haven't memorized, thank goodness, because I don't. (laughs) I love them, but I don't have them memorized. So um, do you care to um, recite them for our listeners? Sure, sure. Um, Well, so the first big one for me is admittedly Proverbs 31, 25. And so this may or may not come as a surprise uh, to some, um, but this is a big one because um, it's really the first scripture that made me feel I'm not alone and made me feel revived. Um, So the scripture is, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. And you know, when you think about that, you know, think about being clothed with strength and dignity, a strength that was taken away when you felt powerless, a dignity that you felt was stolen when when the incident happened or or as it continues to happen, depending on your situation. And 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 just visualizing how God is clothing us in strength and in dignity, he is defining who we are. It's not the violence and it's not the perpetrator that defines us anymore. It is God. Um, And then when you look at she can laugh at the days to come, that joy, right? Because, you know, the scriptures say that there is no tear wasted. There is no, there is no painful experience or hurt that is wasted. God sees and feels all of it. And to know that he can replace that with such joy in our hearts, a joy that overflows, 
is so comforting, even though it may be hard to see that right now. And then the, the, the next scripture that really speaks to me is Isaiah 61, 3, and that is where he bestows on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. A oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And I know when, when you hear these words and when you read the words, especially if you're still stuck in, in a cycle of violence or if you're still stuck in, in the prison of shame or guilt, it is so hard to see the hope in, this, in these words. But when you start to internalize and you start to embrace what this means about how God can transform that pain into something beautiful, it starts to slowly change inside of us. And there is only one person. There is only one that can do that, and that is God. And so um, so I bring up those two scriptures because those have brought, brought such encouragement and just have revived me and so in so many different ways. So I hope that, that they're somewhat comforting to, to those of you that are listening. Yeah, for me, they really instill a sense of hope. And hope is huge when you're struggling and suffering or in just so much pain, or maybe feel empty. You know, some of the things that we know survivors feel. So it's the hope. And I just also think it's so cool that God is so empowering for women. Mm, isn't it amazing? You know, um, I think he loves us best. I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. He gave us the, you know, some people will say the gift, some people will say the curse. But if you look at it, having the ability to have children and to nurture people, or even if you can't have, have children, you are usually women are, are known for being nurturers. And mm -hmm. I, I think we're his favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have a son now too, and he's really precious as well. So maybe <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so, um, do you have a book that you're thinking about writing or writing or, or not, not yet? No, it's, it's funny that you ask. I am actually in the middle of writing a book. Um, and you know, it's funny because, and, and I'm sure there's many listening that can, can maybe, um, relate to this struggle, right? So I think there's the struggle of writer's block. And then there's also the struggle of self-doubt. Mm -hmm. Um, and even in some cases, um, the struggle of, of uh, imposter syndrome, right? So, but I know that God has put in my heart to share my story. And so I um, am I'm working on a book that brings all of these different pieces together. Um, unfortunately, I have witnessed um, or experienced um, either domestic or sexual violence in, in some way throughout most of my life. Um, you know, many of my relationships, especially early on, were were quite abusive and um and i didn't realize it at the time you know i thought that that was the norm and so part of of me writing my story is is hopefully to um to show other women that they are not alone and that you know hopefully there's there's something in my story that they can relate to um and i also want to share a little bit of my um my journey with addiction and you know that has been a very difficult um, piece to break out of. I, I know many of us, especially those of us that um, have been victimized early on, have different ways of coping with, um, with that uh, situation. So after I was sexually assaulted in high school, I started to cope with that through different anxiety-ridden behaviors and through codependency. And, you know, just there was a lot of different issues that came up. So all of this to say that, that my book is, is trying to kind of show this journey. Um, you know, it unfortunately does dive into a bit of a prison, um, you know, a prison of shame and guilt. And it, it explains that and it shows a little bit of how these addictions played a big part big role in my life. Um, but more importantly, I want to focus on the healing and the light at the end of that tunnel that uh, finally started to become clear to me these last couple years. And, um, and so I'm working on that book. And um, I'm hopeful that that come middle of 2021, I'll have a working um, 
copy uh, of the book that, that I can really start to uh, think about moving forward in, in publication, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, again, it's, it's a project that really is in God's hands. And um, I know, especially for, for other, other victims of, of sexual assault, whether it's in high school or college, um, you know, the idea is, is, you know, for us to be aware of these red flags, right? And I know many campuses have started, again, both high school and college, um, have started to really take on this topic. And so I'm hopeful that maybe my book can contribute to the resources that are provided to uh, teenagers and to college age students that um, can really provide some direction when they're in a relationship with someone and they're not sure if it's an abusive relationship or not. Because sometimes, um, especially depending on the types of behaviors the partner um, displays, it can be hard to tell whether or not it is an abusive relationship. So um, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll have a we'll have a book ready to go uh, mid-21. Um, but let's see. I, I'll appreciate any any prayers and, and encouragement around that moving forward. Absolutely. And for those of you listening in, you know, mid-year 2021, because when people find a podcast they like, and I hope they find comfort in this one, um, when her book is released, when, not if, when, um, I will circle back and put the title and the link in the show notes. So people curious about what you've created will have that resource. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I, appreciate that. I really hope, I know you will, but I hope you can see how valuable that will be for other survivors, you know, because I think the, the part where you shared the counselor's reaction, I don't think you're that old. So <laughs> the fact that that message was given to you, you know, not in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s, right? and not the 70s, is still pretty upsetting, you know, that I mean, we call it blame the victim in my in my field. And it's just so easy to do, mm-hmm. you know, to attack the person in front of you that needs help instead of looking at the cycle of violence and how our society allows it to keep going. You know, because we have to change all of society. If we're looking at why racism and misogyny is so widespread, mm. we have to look at society. It's been tolerated for so long. There was a point in time we were we were property. So of yeah. course people could do whatever they want to us. We're property. Right. And even though women's um, advocacy has gone a long, long way, some of that internalized unconscious belief system is still there. And I think that's got, was part of the areas that got to be addressed. Yeah. So I, I know you know this, but a lot of women who are trauma survivors do um, turn to maladaptive coping skills or coping skills that's just really unhealthy for us. Um, are you willing or able to share um, some of the, just what you're comfortable with? Like a lot of women turn to drugs or alcohol is any of that part of your story? Yeah, no, that's that's a really good and a really important question. Um, so I I did turn to some really um, as you as you put it maladaptive uh, coping behaviors um, at the time. I didn't think they were bad or uh, self destructive. Um, they were. Um, so I'll, what I will say is that. Um, and I'm going to put this in, in, I guess, sensitive terms, but I'm sure many listening, you know, if, if you relate to this, you know what the, the real name for this is. Um, you know, I, I mentioned codependency earlier. I was very codependent on relationships after um, the incident happened. Um, and the incident had happened with a boyfriend, actually. So um, after that, my entire perspective of relationships was altered. Um, and I found myself in a place where I needed, not wanted, I needed to be in some sort of a relationship, whether it was emotional or physical, it didn't matter. I just needed something. Um, and that is, that was definitely one of the ways I coped until really, you know, the last couple years when I realized what it was. And when I finally put a name to it, um, 
So that was definitely a big coping uh, problem. I started to fall into alcoholic tendencies as well. Um, alcohol felt great and it helped me forget, um, you know, a lot of the things that I did not want to think about or remember or, um, you know, even if they were, they were current issues. And so um, alcoholism, I feel, was at the brink of starting, um, but I feel that God actually you know, saved me from, from it becoming such a huge, um, you know, such a huge problem for me. And, and really, I think the, the last big one was anxiety. And so um, I was diagnosed with OCD when I was in college. And for a long time, I thought OCD just happens, right? It, you know, and we many times play it off. Oh, well, I'm OCD about this, or I'm OCD about that. But no, this was intense OCD where sometimes I couldn't get out of the house because of just the extreme anxiety that I had. And when you think about OCD, OCD is control. You know, you think you have this belief that an action you do or you don't do and the number of times you do it can control the outcome of, of X, Y, or Z. And so um, I had extreme OCD um, and it really started after the incident happened. And um, that's when I started seeing a therapist a couple years ago and um, really doing a deep dive into some of these issues that I'm now able to talk to you all about. Um, and so those are just an, a few of uh, the handful of, um, of issues and, and um, coping, um, coping behaviors and responses and, and addictions. I, I haven't mentioned all of them um, that I've struggled with. And I will say um, that one of the things that has helped me put a name to some of these things is something that I actually recently discovered with Celebrate Recovery. Um, so this is, um, it's, it's actually, a, it's a recovery program that in many ways is modeled after AA. And so there are steps and there's, um, you know, there's a process in the healing. And the first thing is saying, putting a name to what is in hiding because the enemy loves for things to stay in the dark. And until we can come out and be honest with ourselves and with God primarily, but then with others, then can we start to heal from that? So Celebrate Recovery has helped me put a name to some of these addictions, some of these coping behaviors, and um, I'm starting to see those those chains break, you know, and again, there's only one who can really do that, and that's God. So um, it's just it's just been amazing to see this change in myself that I never for a while, never even wanted to change because that became who I was. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure many of you listening can can relate to some of these things I'm mentioning, but it's amazing how one incident can create this huge domino effect in our lives that right. affect yeah. a number of other relationships we go into. Yeah, you said so many important things. Um, it's been my experience that trauma impacts every single area of our lives. And the thing about the maladaptive behaviors or coping skills that aren't health, healthy for us is we don't, at the beginning, most of us don't know it's because of trauma. We think we're just bad, right. you know, um, or we're shameful or we're perverse or we have no control. <laughs> and uh, it's, important to have the therapy and, and support groups and you know whatever that looks like for you because it can uncover so many things that you've internalized and beat yourself up for that really aren't your fault now that doesn't give you permission to keep doing it right we need to take responsibility and get help um, but the reason you started is really not your fault you're, you're, you're trying to comfort yourself any way you could find. And there's a lot of maladaptive um, behaviors we haven't talked about. And we will in the future of the podcast, like for me, it was emotionally eating. And I was in denial about that a long time, despite being a therapist. I thought I just love food. Um, it, it's, it's deeper than that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I know those um, behaviors that can in the past uh, make us feel shame can be difficult to talk about. So I really appreciate that you shared those. Um, just because I know women out there who are survivors are going through, you know, similar thing. Definitely. definitely. No, I'm, I'm happy to share. And, and I will say that, 
um, there you you touched on something. You know, there's shame. We already feel ashamed about the incident, or or you know, for those of us that are in an ongoing abusive relationship, where you know we feel guilt or shame about staying in it. Um, and then you know, add on top of that. Um, a coping behavior that we realize is a little bit self-destructive, but it's the only thing we know that comforts us. Um, and, you know, then there's shame added on for, for that. And, you know, it, it just continues to pile on and it gets to the point where you feel, I can't go to God. Like, I am way too far gone for God to ever help me. Um, and that's the beauty that we're never too far gone for God to help us. Never. Amen for that. Yes. Yes. The more we've suffered, the more we hurt, the more he is there for us. Yes. Yes. So in wrapping up and obviously you can say anything you feel you didn't get to say yet for the audience, but I'm hoping, um, I find you to be a very good I find your prayers really good. I'm, I know I'm not being fancy with my language right now. Um, I'm hoping that you will close this out in, in prayer for those who, who could be comforted from that as well. Okay. And of course, you're, if we missed anything that you want to um, pass on, um, like I know women can work with you by um joining any of the initiatives you have or, or the group at grace or um if, but if there's a good way for them to reach you too if you could also explain how they can reach you thank of you of course of course thank you karen um so before we pray i'll just go ahead and share two things um so we have just launched uh latinx voices and the women's caucus of APHA. we have just launched together a storytelling platform for survivors um and for victims of, of domestic and sexual violence and this is an anonymous platform where we want to give you a chance to um, give voice to your story which can hopefully inspire others um, so the website for that is, is breakingthesilenceproject.org. And, and of course, I'll, I'll have Karen uh, share the link as well on, on her website. Um, and additionally, for any of you that are interested to join um, the survivors support group that we're starting at Grace Community or any of the other things that we're, that we're trying to get off the ground with, um, with other survivors, please feel free to reach me via email. So I'm at psosa077 at gmail.com. Um, and, and I'd be very happy to get you connected to other women and, and just get you in, into this, um, you know, cycle of support and love and, you know, really start replacing, um, you know, some of the other things that you may be feeling with, with the love that we're called to give. So with that, uh, thank you again for, for inviting me on. And if you can bow your head with me so we can close in prayer. Um, Lord Jesus, I, I just first want to thank you for, for Karen hosting this podcast at all and, you know, for really giving, um, for really giving me a chance as well as other, other speakers and guests that she's had on to, to hold our story and to really give the credit to you. This is a chance for us to glorify your name and for us to show and share with others how you replace our ashes, replace our pains and our hurts and our traumas with love and beauty and dignity and healing. And so, Lord, that is my prayer right now. For all the women listening, Lord, I pray for healing in their lives. I pray for comfort where they need comfort. And I pray, Lord, that you just hold them and that you remind them that they are yours and that they are beautifully and wonderfully made in your image. So, Lord Jesus, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you all the honor, for you are our king, you are our father, and you are our healer. Thank you so much, and it is in your mighty name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now everybody can agree with me. That was so good. How did you <laughs> learn how to pray? Um, I, um, I'm not sure. I've actually never thought that I've, I did good prayers, but mm -hmm. um, I come from a from a family of strong woman prayer warriors. So maybe they rubbed off on me. <laughs> Got to give credit to my mom, to my grandmother, to to my aunts. They are all really strong prayer warriors. So so thank you for for saying that. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paulina, it was 
such a pleasure having you today. And I'm appreciative of everything you shared with um, our listeners. I, I, I need you to know you're, you're, you're making a difference. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Karen. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening in today. Please join us next week, same day and time. Also, I would love for you to check out my website, healthrivedream.com.